this uh, PC, which, you know, no one knows where this stuff came from. It just kind of, PC just kind of appeared. Well, it didn't. It was the Frankfurt School. That's where it appeared. And the Frankfurt School, it's, it's a real interesting little piece. Frankfurt School was in Germany, obviously, brought on PC. Marx picked it up, thought it was a great idea for his government. By the Second World War, Hitler was such an anti-communist that the that the Franklin School had to move, so the, or probably the Frank, Frankfurt School, so they moved here to the Columbia University campus. You will find the Frankfurt School on Columbia's property. Oh, interesting. That's where political correctness came from. I like the history of all of this stuff so that I understand what's happening today. I want to know who my enemy is. Our enemy is cultural Marxism, and that's with Hollywood, with everything. <laughs> well, if you look at this on the surface, it looks insane. You wonder, how can they come up with these crazy ideas? And what is their goal? But if you don't understand the philosophy of cultural Marxism, it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. But if you realize that they thri thrive on chaos and they're, what their goals are, uh, the ultimate goal and the overriding goal is to undermine the Judeo-Christian moral values and the values of family. And uh, therefore, uh, how do we undermine that? They've tried other things to spread Marxism, but it hasn't worked. They've tried it with militarism as well as economic sanctions and economic controls, but it doesn't do, do the trick. So they're coming along with this cultural Marxism. And uh, if, uh, if you didn't understand what their goal is, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But uh, once you understand what their goal is, because out of the chaos, then they're going to establish this Marxist notions, although it's modified from the original Marx. And, but world domination, uh, you know, the uh, society that has no boundaries and no borders, uh, and, you know, an, a very, very ideal, impossible situation of having no borders and everybody living in, uh, in a free society and respecting other people's rights. You know, this wouldn't be a big thing. But that's not what they're talking about because sometimes you have libertarians say no borders and all. But this is completely different. This means no borders, worldwide uh, unity, worldwide government held together by force and based on the assumption that people have no ability to take care of themselves. They don't even know how to provide for themselves. So it's always in need. But the greatest need is for a few individuals who believe that they are superior to everybody else and that the average person is incapable of assuming responsibility for themselves. And they go and, uh, and they take over. They, they, these authoritarians take over. So this is what they're doing. They're undermining values. And that's probably going to run through the theme of our conversation today. My friends, what am I talking about today? I talked about the flourishing of civilization in Europe. I am now talking about the death of civilization in Europe. I am talking about the death of civilization under Charles Schumer and the birth of civilization under Donald Trump in plain English. That's part of Trump's war. You understand what we're talking about? It's, a, it's an attempt to have a rebirth of sanity in America. Of course they're going to scream loudly and continuously, and the snowflakes will be out there screaming and rioting so they can meet each other and go have rampant sex after the, the rallies. We understand that. It's a party in the streets. You go out there high on a doobie or on some medical marijuana, you know, and you have a little riot against Trump. You screech and you scream, and who knows who you might meet. You might meet the love of your, not life, of course. There is no permanency in those groups. You might meet the love of your night if you go to an anti-Trump rally. Cultural Marxism is, Marxism is the idea that you need to create social equality, not not equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome. So you need to create equality of outcome in social settings while also degrading the moral uh, standards of a society in order to pave the way for actual communism. Not all um, social, cultural Marxists want full communism, but they do all believe in some form of Marxist socialism. I don't think that you can understand the current situation properly without considering the role that postmodernism plays in this because postmodernism 
in many ways, especially as it's played out politically, is the new skin that the old Marxism now inhabits. So you could think that there's, there's a postmodern philosophy, which we'll talk about a bit, that really came into its vogue in the 1970s after classic Marxism, especially of the economic type, had been so thoroughly discredited that no one but an absolute reprobate could, 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 uh, could support it publicly anymore. Even the French intellectuals had to admit that communism was a bad deal by the, by the end of the 1960s. And what happened was that there, they played a sleight of hand game in some sense and rebranded themselves under the postmodern guise. And that's where identity politics came from. And so, and then that spread like wildfire from France, especially into the US, through Yale University, through the English department there, and then everywhere. And, and so, what happened was, you know, there was this idea that the Marxists had put forth that the natural landscape of economic landscape is a battle. And it's a battle between the proletariat, the working class, and the bourgeois. And that the that that economic systems were doomed to continue to enslave people and to keep them poor and downtrodden unless there was a radical economic transformation that was predicated on something more like equity policy. And then that was put in, into place in many, many places, as, as you no doubt know, throughout the 20th century, with absolute, m absolutely murderous results. It was the most destructive economic and political doctrine, I think, that was, has ever been invented by mankind. And that includes National Socialism, because the, the absolute magnitude of the havoc wreaked by the communist systems exceeded that wreaked by Hitler. And, and, and that's, I mean, Hitler didn't have quite as long as long a time to pull his stunts off quite as effectively, but it was a catastrophic system. Gee, and none of this is subtle. These people have gone way beyond subtle. You know, we have social justice tribunals in Ontario. They're named that. And the, the, the educators in Ontario, the teachers, have already decided that the goal of the education system is to indoctrinate children from kindergarten, from kindergarten, into a radical postmodern leftist communitarian equity oriented ethos that's what they're doing they're even subsuming the teaching of mathematics and science under that umbrella and none of this is subtle man you just go online and download the documents and read them and if you read them critically and carefully well you do. since i've been really looking into this which would be since last September, really, starting to look at it from a legislative and policy level. I mean, the first thing I came across was the Ontario Human Commission, Ontario Human Rights Commission website, which is an absolute travesty. Those people are so dangerous, it's almost, you, you almost can't believe it. That thing, that, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, it should be abolished. It's a very subversive and dangerous organization, as are the human rights tribunals. Those things are dangerous. The Ontario Institute for the Studies of Education, that bloody thing is a fifth column. The people, who, the people who, are, who are producing the educators that emerge from that institute, they should be put on trial for treason. Like, it's serious stuff. We're in a chaotic time, and you know, I've got letters from people all over the world who tell me how they can't say what they think. It's like, oh, well, that's not very good. And they're kind of happy with me because maybe they think that I emboldened them in some way, and so good, good for that hypothetically, and most of the people who wrote me, the overwhelming majority, were reasonable, so I'm pretty happy about that, too. But, and maybe I'm wrong about my damn diagnosis, because, like, what do I know? But I do have this proclivity to get to the bottom of things. And what's at the bottom of this is an ideological war, or philosophical war. It's even deeper than that. It might even be deeper than a philosophical war, which is something that's more like a metaphysical or a theological war. You know, it depends on how far down you look. And the postmodernists know exactly what they're doing. This isn't accidental. Of course you shut down speakers you don't agree with, because you can't have a dialogue with them then anyways, because human beings can't have dialogue. There's no such thing as a human individual. There's no such thing as truth. Here's the postmodern world. It's the Hobbesian nightmare. It's everyone against everyone else, except it's not individuals, it's groups. And you're stuck in your damn group, and it's the only thing about you anyways that's relevant, which is why we might base our hiring on it, for example. 
and you're oppressed and even if you don't know it it's only because you've internalized it and it's the only thing that's real about you anyways and I can't talk to you because I'm in my own little silo of privileged belief and besides we can't use logic because that doesn't exist and so you're in a group and I'm in a group and all we can do is have a war or we can talk but we don't get to talk because you can't talk if you're a postmodernist because speech is just chatter so when it's just chatter that, that supports the people in power that's how they think and so the whole world is this little armed war of identity group against identity group against identity group and you shut down people who don't agree with you because why should you let them talk it's you don't believe in any of the reasons why you would let someone talk so this isn't accidental it's not because they're afraid although it's also because of that they hijack you know fear they hijack compassion they make anyone who who puts forward an alternative view into a terrorist of ideas and someone who's heartless at the core which is really incredibly intelligent it's such a good strategy it's so devious and brilliant and it's so effective because who want the, who the hell wants to be labeled a bigot you probably are a damn bigot just like everybody. voted up 77 votes australia is holding a plebiscite on whether to legalize gay marriage I'm against the Yes campaign, but only because it's backed by cultural Marxists. I'm curious to hear your views on gay marriage. Well, I would be against it too if it was backed by cultural Marxists, because it isn't clear to me that um, it will satisfy the ever-increasing, what would you call, demand for an assault on traditional modes of being. Now, with regards to gay marriage specifically, that's a really tough one for me, because, you know, I can imagine I can't do anything really other than spout platitudes about it I suppose unfortunately you know if if the marital vows are taken seriously then it seems to me that it's a means whereby gay people can be integrated more thoroughly into standard society and that's probably a good thing and maybe that would decrease promiscuity which is a public health problem um, although obviously that's not limited to gay people, um, although gay men tend to be more promiscuous than average, uh, probably because there's no women to bind them um, with regards to their sexual activity.